Thank you so much for joining us today. It's my privilege representing Westminster Seminary and Unio Cum Cristo to interview Dr. Dan Strange. He is a theological leader from the United Kingdom. He'll be speaking at our Gaffin Lecture uh, Series this year. And so it's a great privilege to welcome you, Dan. Thanks for being with That's us. Great Can to I be say here. welcome to great campus? To be here. Okay. Thank you. So let's begin by uh, asking just a few basic questions. Yeah. How did you come to know the Lord and uh, how did you get a call to ministry? Well, uh, my dad was from Guyana in South America originally and uh, came over to the UK in the 1960s. He uh, has kind of a Hindu background, culturally Hindu, wasn't really practicing. Married my mum, uh, who was a believer, and um, my mum is a kind of high Anglican, but there was no youth work, so we went to the local Baptist church, and there was a, there's a, an organisation called the Boys' Brigade. Yeah. Um, I don't know whether you have that here. I, I, I was in a Boys' oh, Brigade well, as you a young child. So I was converted through the Boys' Brigade, okay, and wonderful. the church was my kind of social life. Um, and I think I probably, um, I probably had to realise that I wasn't a Christian, um, but we enjoyed all, all the social activities. And then uh, one very normal Sunday, I just uh, realized, wow, Jesus is what Jesus said, who he is, is true. And I remember getting down in my minister's study and there was a big picture of the, um, the Holman Hunt painting, Light of the World, I still remember, and uh, gave my life to Christ, I was 16. Good, and then how did you go from there into ministry? What did you do in yeah. terms of studies and that sort of well, thing? Well, yeah, so I, I think because of my dad's background, I've always been interested in what's the relationship between my faith as a Christian and other religions. So I went to study at Bristol University, Theology and Religious Studies, and I'll be mentioning this tomorrow, a very, very hard degree if you are a Bible-believing Christian. It was very liberal, very secular. Um, and I did uh, my undergraduate there and enjoyed the study. And then one of my uh, professors there, who's a very well-known uh, Roman Catholic theologian called Gavin de Costa, he's probably the world authority on the Catholic Church's relationship to other religions, he asked would I stay to do a PhD with him. Wow. So my PhD was on um, the evangelical theologian Clark Pinnock yeah. and his uh, doctrine of the unevangelized. And I was trying to give a reform critique to Pinnock's inclusivism because he believed that people could be saved by Christ without confessing him. And um, my PhD was on that subject. So I stayed there um, and did my PhD. And I was married uh, by then. Um, so then I did five years just working with, um, well, it's the equivalent, I suppose, it's intervarsity. Mm -hmm. But I only work with theological students. So um, this is how amazingly, providentially, God lines everything up. Even though I had a terrible experience, that gave me the experience to help other Christians who had decided to go to study theology in mainline universities. So I spent five years traveling up and down the country ministering to those students. And then I got a call one day from um, David Peterson, who was the principal of Oak Hill College. And he said, um, I think we need to be having this subject called public theology. I don't know what it is. I didn't know what it was. Would I be interested in applying for the role? And so in 2005, I um, became a lecturer in culture, religion, and public theology. And I've been at Oak Hill for 16 years. And then, but just recently in the last year, I've moved to a new role. Um, a few years ago, Oak Hill um, and Acts 29 Church Planting Network, um, we um, kind of came up with a, a new in-context theological training model called Crosslands. And I'm now working for Crosslands as a, as a director with a, in an organisation called Crosslands Forum, which is a centre for cultural engagement and mission, trying to help the church work out how do we honour Christ in this particular culture. So it's a big, big move for us, having been at a seminary for a long time. So we've now moved from London up to Newcastle, the city, last major city before you get to Scotland, which is four or five hours drive, which I know for you guys is taking someone <laughs> to soccer practice, but for us, it's kind of the other side of the world. So uh, we're just getting used to a, a new life. And um, yeah, so that's something of, of my history. So very good. So, well, how did you decide what public theology was since you were asked to teach a few oh, of well, new to you? Well, the great thing is that public theology still is quite a, an embryonic discipline. So there's so many diff <laughs> definitions. So I, th I tried to make it my own to say I'm teaching evangelical public theology and especially how, what does public theology mean for those who are training for ministry? Um, I did a third year class on public theology and I think a lot of the students, and many of them who are going into leadership in churches, 
were thinking, oh no, this guy's going to be telling me I need to be getting into politics. And I was saying, look, at the end of the day, I want you to be doing what you think you should be doing, but I want you to understand your world, to equip the saints for works, works of service, to be involved in thinking about their vocation from a Christian point of view as you disciple them, as you preach to them. And once I kind of preempted with that, then they got the point yeah. of it. That's and uh, I think that's, that was very Im important. So as you look at uh, your ministry, have you done any pastoral work directly? You've always been oh, in the well, academic so I, Yeah, I'm, so I've been a, an el I'm a Reformed Baptist, so I've been an elder at a Reformed Baptist church for uh, many years. At the moment, we've just moved to a new church, so we're just getting uh, in, into that now. Um, but um, I imagine if, if um, an eldership possibility came up, I'd, I'd be very happy to, to serve there. Yeah. How, how did you develop your Reformed theological convictions? Oh, um, that's a great question. I mean, I, I'm, I suppose I'm such an, uh, 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 a pro this is not a good advertisement for the theological education system in the UK, but because my formal education was so liberal, um, all of my, uh, what I would say, confessional theological education has been kind of on the fly, really, just trying to work out. And I think when you end up, when I ended up, I think I became very disillusioned with um, prescribing that evangelicals should go to study theology at a, a secular department, unless they wanted, they, they had a missionary calling. But that, it's, it was so deconstructive when you want to do construction. So I think a number of us ended up teaching at Oak Hill and now at Crosslands to give people the education that we never had because of that's the situation in, in the UK. And I think I was probably kind of smallly evangelical and then uh, more conservative evangelical. And then it was actually the doctrine of particular redemption that I thought, wow, this, this makes sense to me. So then I suppose I became more Calvinistic that's and great. reformed. And then I came into contact with um, well, some of the people who have taught, taught here and uh, started reading John Murray and Van Til, and I was very convicted um, in, kind of, in terms of that way of understanding Reformed theology. That's great. So as we look at uh, the Van Til name, how do you see the classic contributions of Cornelius Van Til for your work that you're doing, your, your cultural engagement, public theology? How, how does Van yeah. Til shape into that? I mean, I, th I think... Sometimes, as you will know, there's a kind of quite a temperamental element to theology. And I like thinking in like the meta methodology. Methodology is so important because when I was studying at Bristol, you could be talking about anything. But as soon as the conversation, you carried on the conversation, it would always come down to what is your authority? Where are you getting this from? And of course, I, I, I really appreciate Van Til because I think it is a, the most rigorous understanding of what sola scriptura means, that we are to interpret the world through the word and that that is foundational for life and everything and even I mean all the nuances that go with that but it, it, it's that rigorous application of thinking biblically that I really appreciate so I think Van Til um, in in that area I found him very helpful good and as you read John Murray what was Murray's contributions oh, well, to your thinking well I mean redemption accomplished and applied was just like I still think that it's, it's so it's so amazing, it's so rich, it's so exegetical, and as a kind of a a one stop shop for what does the work of Christ mean, what does the application mean, um, of a, a, a redemption mean. I I found that such a helpful little book, so I go back to that. And then Murray's um, Murray's uh, paper on common grace, I've always loved that paper, and still I don't think there's anything that's really ma rivaling that in terms of. Um, what, how, he, how he understands common grace. So those two little things, redemption accomplished and applied, and the essay on common grace, I found very helpful. That's good. As you think through your uh, experience of theology, where did uh, Dr. Gaffin's writings enter into your thinking? Uh, you're here to honor his yes. legacy in some ways. So yeah. and, and what, how did you engage Dr. Gaffin? Yeah, prob probably more, I mean, I, I mean in terms of reading, um, reading on, uh, well, the lectures that, uh, Dr. Gaffin gave in 2004, so I think I was around, I hadn't quite started at Oak Hill, that they were the lectures at Oak Hill in London that became By Faith Not By Sight eventually, um, and uh, I really in enjoyed those lectures. I think it's more through other people who have distilled some of his writings. I think the two things for me would be the how does, and this is from a kind of a conservative evangelical background, we remember trying to piece together a theological kind of 
Korea. How does the resurrection fit in? And for me, understanding, you know, what does it mean that we're raised to life, um, you know, by justification? What does that mean? What does it mean that, that it vindicated by the Spirit in, the, in 1 Timothy 3.16? And it was that piecing together of the place of the resurrection and, of course, union with Christ. But especially for me, the penny dropped when I thought, yeah, I now see how the, res the resurrection is not an add-on. It's so crucial. And that I think that, that teaching on the resurrection was very formative for me. That's good. As you look at uh, the uh, moment in time that you're living in the United Kingdom, what are the public issues that particularly engage Christians there that you're trying to train your students to understand and engage? Yes, well, I mean, I mean I've heard in the last eight or nine days kind of the recognition that America is com coming in the direction where, it, where the UK has been heading. And uh, there's been recently been a piece where someone's commented that we're moving from, in the States, what was called um, an affirming culture about Christianity to a neutral culture. We're now more moving into what's called negative space. And I think in the UK, we're definitely in that situation. It's really hard. Um, and uh, it's just trying to help Christians to see that if they are not being formed by Christ in all of their lives, not just what they do at church, but in their vocations, their thinking on everything, if they are not being formed by Christ, then they are being deformed by something else. And I think there still can be an anti-intellectualism and a pietism that means that we're not thinking what does it mean to think through the Bible and to apply a biblical worldview to all of life. And uh, that's disappointing. And um, I think that, you know, Christianity is, is under threat and uh, all the issues that we're facing, I mean, the, the same issues here, what does it mean to be a human person? Issues to do with sexuality, um, issues to do with just civility, which I'll be, I'll be mentioning tomorrow. So. Is, does the uh, United Kingdom have a cancel culture? And oh, of course, yes. What does it look like on your side of the ocean? Um, it means that um, a, a sports person who's in their late 20s, who wrote a tweet when they were 18, which was definitely misogynistic, has be, uh, uh, means that they're, they're maybe not able to play again. And I think the issue is with cancel culture, Charles Taylor, the philosopher, wrote a really interesting piece where he said, um, humanism thought they were doing as a favor by getting rid of the doctrine of sin and the doctrine of depravity. The problem is when you do that, you raise the bar so high that no one can meet that. And when you can't meet it, you've got no nothing else to go back to because you think humans should be able to do this. You we've deified human humanity. And then you, we just get coercive and angry when people can't do it. And um, that's where in some ways, you know, the, the, the amazing truth that we have, not that the Jesus is just a standard, but Jesus is the savior. And we do believe in forgiveness and restoration. And uh, um, there's a book that um, lots of people have been reading by a um, a, a, a commentator, he's um, a gay atheist guy called Douglas Murray called The Madness of Crowds, which is a very good interpretation of what's going on in all kinds of areas, social issues. But he makes the point, he has this little bit at the end where he says, we've lost the idea of forgiveness. And tragically, he says, I, I don't know where, where, where do we get this from? Wouldn't it be wonderful if we had this understanding of forgiveness? And he knows that it's the Judeo-Christian background that's enabled that. Um, so it's hard soil. But, you know, this is where the Lord has placed us. And I think there's, as Christians, we cannot, you know, Ecclesiastes 7, 9, you know, do not say why were the old days better than these. It's not wise to think upon such things. There's a, there can be a nostalgia and a sense of sentimentality that is not constructive. This is where God has placed us. We need to be faithful to our calling and uh, take every thought captive. How, how does a Christian today speak to a Marxist or, let's say, to a new atheist that, doesn't want to hear anything that they have to say. Yeah, I think, well, I think from, um, we have to recognize, and I'll be mentioning this tomorrow, that uh, we live by faith, not by sight, which means that if the Bible is true about what it says about human beings, that everyone is religious, everyone knows God and doesn't know, everyone's running to God and running away. I mean, this is why, you know, Romans 1 and Acts 17 has been so foundational for you know, Van Til and others. It's that complex anthropology. So we need to have faith that there will always be a point of contact. And what I'm trying to develop, especially through the writings of J.H. Bavinck, who um, um, was um, heavily influenced Harvey Kahn, 
uh, who, who obviously was here, um, is this idea that they're these magnetic points, they're these scratches, that all, that these itches that all human beings have to scratch. And Bavink was in Indonesia. He applied it to kind of his other religions context. And what I've been trying to do is say, we need to apply that same analysis here to the nuns, the people who don't necessarily believe in anything, because we know that human beings are religious. But it's finding that point of where we can then, as I'll be talking about tomorrow, the whole idea of elenctics, unmasking sin. What have you done with God? And uh, I think there's always a point of contact. So that's that in terms of non-Christians. And I think then at a theoretical level, yeah, we need to develop what, um, what people are calling a Christian high theory, that we not just look at the Bible, but we look through the Bible and we use the biblical interpretation to um, think about things at a very philosophical level to interpret everything else. And again, that's why I think Van Til is so important. So there's lots of things that, that we should be doing. I think, the, and then the final thing, I think it's probably is very mundane. I just think Christians need to be kind. We need to be, this idea of convicted civility, that we have strong convictions, we know what, what we believe, but let's be civil about it in a very incivil world. How, how are we kind to each other? How do we listen carefully? How do we give, don't caricature or stereotype? Um, I think that that posture that we have um, I think sometimes people think because we're about to enter into this very negative cultural space, we need to be negative back. I suppose I'm thinking, how are we positive in the negative space to be able to say something of Christ? But it's hard, and, and that and, you know we need we need God's help. Good. As you uh, look at your own professional life, is there anything you've written that you particularly think best represents your work? Oh, great question. Uh, yeah, I think the um, two things. I think uh, the I did a big monograph on a theology of religion. So what's the theological approach to other religions called uh, Their Rock is Not Like Our Rock. It's in Zondervan, there's an, a UK edition uh, as well. I think that's a kind of more academic work, looking at the um, systematics, but also the history of reformed theology and how we engage other religions. Not just the question of soteriology, but the question of truth and even why has God allowed other religions to, to flourish? So that's a kind of my major like monograph on that. Um, and then I think, yeah, just a, um, a, a book I've just written in the last few months called Making Faith Magnetic, which is a popular book for churches, for Christians, taking these magnetic points and saying, how do we apply this anthropology to people in the West? And how might churches get together and work out what are the issues? How do we get this point of contact to be able to say something about Christ and how Jesus is this phrase, the subversive fulfillment of all of, of, of cult, the culture's desires. Um, there has to be subversion, there has to be repentance, there has to be turning around, but there's also connection as well. So at a popular level, making faith magnetic, and then at a more academic level, their rock is not like our rock. Um, if you want a summary of that, then there's a, another little essay that's just about to come out in a festschrift to Sinclair Ferguson, where I'm dealing with this issue of elenctics and the magnetic points, and I think that's about to drop as well. So there are three things left. That's good. If you were to simply define what are the most important magnetic points, what are they? Oh, so the magnetic points are uh, totality. We all, have a, we all have this issue of how do we connect or belong to something bigger. Um, if we don't do that, we feel insignificant. But when we connect, we feel significant as humans. Now, of course, that's meant to be to God, but it, we connect to all kinds of other things. Norm, is there a way to live? We all have standards, we all have norms and rules, not necessarily Christian standards, but everyone has norms that we, li we live by. Deliverance, is there a way out? We all know there's something wrong with the world, um, uh, but what is the problem and how do we fix it? How do I even have deliverances to get through the day many people are struggling with? Destiny, is there a way we control? We know that we both, Baving has this great phrase, we know that we both lead our lives and undergo our lives. It's the issue of fate and freedom. Do we have agency? Am I just a victim or do I have power? Um, and then finally, the, the super magnetic point, um, a higher power, is there a way beyond? Is there a reality beyond reality? And so I think everyone is asking these particular, they're living these questions, they're not necessarily consciously, but if the Bible is, is what it says, that all people have been hardwired to know God's eternal power and divine nature, the magnetic points come out of that exegesis of Romans 1.20, to say that these magnetic points, people are just answering them in the way that they live. And that's our point of contact. That's great. On a very different subject, yes. uh, as we watch the world stage in the news right now, as it's very troubled with the, what's happening in the Ukraine and with Russia, how is that impacting the mindset 
of uh, the people in, in Great Britain. Obviously, they're farther removed because they're an island nation, but yes. they're part of the European spirit that I think once thought of themselves as post-war, and all of a sudden... Yeah, yeah. Well, so what's the psyche of the yeah, people? Yeah, so here, now, so, I mean, I've got, um, so obviously there's, uh, there's distress and there's a lot of compassion for the Ukrainian people, which is brilliant and lots of churches are getting together we're about to uh, i think accept uh, a lot of ukrainian I immigrants and working out how can we partner with them um i think though from a cultural point of view i, I am aware of just being careful of what might be called virtue singling or sin sentimentality in that it, people it's back to this idea of totality people want something to belong to and this is a great cause and that it is a cause that we need to support but the way i suppose that I, in my sinful heart, and then those who don't know Christ, kind of latch onto something like that in a way that sentimentality, it kind of, it, 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 it's being emotional about my emotion and it's not counting the cost. And I just wonder, maybe because we're an island, it can be quite easy to help. And I'm just aware of that um, as well, and in, my, in, in my own heart as well. But I think there's a lot of, uh, there's a lot of um, outpouring of, of um, compassion I think also I hadn't quite realised, I was talking to someone, a pastor in um, Pittsburgh just over the weekend, and again, this probably is my um, a generation just a few years back from me, that, I mean, I was, you know, I remember 1989, the wall coming down, but I hadn't lived in that kind of Cold War era. But I imagine for people of an older generation who did, there's a whole other sense of um, resonances there that I think is is like that as well. And I think there's a, there's, a, there, there's a lot of fear. What's been interesting is I preached, um, I was preaching in Belfast the other week and I'd chosen the passage weeks ago and then this was the week of the invasion. And it, um, it was Isaiah 41 about the approaching menace, Cyrus coming, and two responses. The, the nations will build idols to try and protect themselves and those will fail. They will not stop Cyrus, but it's God who gives us our identity, Israel my servant, Jacob, whom I have loved, Abraham, my friend. And I think there's, whether it's Ukraine or COVID, it is a culture of fear. And how are we as Christians, are we going to echo that fearfulness? Or are we going to um, reappropriate our fear to say that, well, Christ is the only one that well, we need to live in reverent fear. And then that kind of deals with, reduces the other fears. If we can be a fearless people, I think that's an amazing witness at this time when there is a when people are scared maybe on a very personal level yeah. as you've had a uh, unusual family experience as you've described it and you've moved or your family moved to a different culture and now we're talking about refugees what should we know for those of us who maybe are more settled about people who are dislocated is this an opportunity to show the gospel to be a witness to seek to be a caretaker what, what does the gospel call us to do? Oh, yes. Like so, I mean, these? I think, you know, the idea that, uh, of, you know, sojourners um, and passing through, I mean, that in that sense, where do we have our identity? Um, I think that, that there's, there's great lessons that we, can, um, that we can take to help those who are displaced. I think that's important. I think it's also recognising how do you, and again, this is, a, I don't know how you, we, we work this out, but how do people continue to... Um, um, celebrate their own background but realizing that they are in a different country and i, th I think that that th these are all the issues of what it means to live in a, in a multicultural society but the church has a great opportunity to be hospitable in fact you know and the nation nations have the opportunity but especially christians we should be uh, taking this as an opportunity to um, open our doors and help people um, uh, as we as we are able good well, thank you so much for sharing. Is there something we didn't address you wish we would have, or maybe a, a final thought that's on your mind? Not really, no. Okay. <laughs> yes, it's okay. okay. Are you happy? Well, I'm very happy. Let me ask you this question yeah. as we wrap up then. How can Westminster become more effective in reaching toward theological brothers in the Reformed tradition in the UK and beyond? As you get to know us over here, how can our partnership and how can we help each other in our work? Yes, I think... I think um, I'll be saying this tomorrow. I, it, it's a recognition that, um, well, the title of the Gaffin Lecture, Theology, 
culture and mission, they need to be integrated within a curriculum. And that if mission is not a fight between the worship of God, what Clowney used to say, the nurturing of the Christian and then evangelism, but we need all of those three to be going on at the same time. And then to realise that we increasingly, I think we need to collaborate, not getting rid of our distinctives, but to say, where are other um, reformed believers that we could work with and do things together to collaborate in a very complex world and to break down some of the tribalism within the church and without? I mean, I think that I'm, I'm quite passionate about that. Now, how do we do that and maintain our distinctives? I mean, that, that's hard. But I think to have those kinds of collaborations and also to expose students to different um, expressions of the Reformed faith across the world. Um, I mean, I know that you were involved in that missions book that Westminster did recently, but I think that exposure is, is good for uh, all Christians, that cross fertilization. Um, and so they're kind of an openness to, to embrace other expressions of the Reformed faith. Um, and and learn and learn about our, our blind spots because that's where um, sometimes we need someone from another culture to be helping us as we can help them and I think that's the wonderful thing about the uh, the global Christian community okay. well thank you for being with us and blessings we'll look forward to your lecture tomorrow thank you okay